Good morning and happy Easter to you. Welcome to worship with First Baptist Church on 5th in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My name is Emily Hull McGee and I'm one of the pastors at First Baptist and I'm delighted to welcome you to worship with this community of faith in the heart of downtown Winston-Salem. This Easter may look very different from many others we have experienced. You may find yourself nestled in at home with your family right around you. You may find yourself in unusual rhythms and different patterns of your weeks and your days, but yet we have come here to worship, trusting that God has done something new in our midst, that God is breaking forth in new ways, that all things, that all creation is being made new. It's Frederick Beekner who reminds us that resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. That is good news to us any day, but that is especially good news to us on this Easter day. And so as we enter now into our time of worship, would you find yourself listening for signs of new life, looking for seeds of abundance around you, listening for God and Christ to make all things new? Let us worship God together. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. And he said, Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Jesus Christ has risen. He, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Jesus Christ has risen. He, he has risen, risen indeed. indeed. Christ is risen indeed. Let's join together in singing the good news of this day.
Jesus is alive. As Jesus was with his disciples, he told them, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. What an awesome resurrection gift for all seasons. The peace of Christ has been given to us. So no matter where you are, we share that peace with all people and with each other by extending these words, may the peace of Christ be with you. Our New Testament lesson is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are his witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God, as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Risen Christ, we are filled with joy as we approach the empty tomb, just as the women did many years ago. Our spirits are singing your praises and our lips wish to tell of this good news. But we also approach with suspicious steps and hesitant belief. We hear the call, do not be afraid. And we try to put on our bravest faces, but there is so much to fear. Today, we find ourselves in the midst of restrictions and regulations due to the continued spread of a virus. Instead of our traditional gathering together to celebrate the resurrected one, we find ourselves scattered in our separate homes, celebrating in our separate ways. We find ourselves holding tight to our anxieties and anger. We are hearing the voices that tell us there is little hope to be found, and we start to believe they might be true. Our voices shake with uncertainty as we attempt to speak of the hope we do see, we struggle to see the end of this exile. Compassionate God, to you, these are familiar feelings. They are the same feelings of dread and uncertainty you felt in the garden as you prayed for the cup to be taken from you. But let us not forget, from the darkness, your son Jesus arose and spoke words of hope. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my followers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Help us to see past our fears and anxieties to the presence of your spirit that surrounds us. May our anxieties and anger dissipate. May our voices loudly speak words of praise and hope. May we behold, may we behold your light shining in the darkness. Sisters and brothers, hear these words of assurance. Just as Peter spoke these words to the disciples so long ago, he speaks them to us today. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. The prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through Jesus' name. Thanks be to God. I now invite us to continue in the spirit of prayer, but now I invite you to pray with your eyes open so that you can see so many fellow members of your beloved community giving voice to the prayers that many around this world have, especially in this time of pandemic, in this time of crisis. 
we will conclude our prayer by praying together the words that our Lord taught us. So would you go with me now in prayer? For healthcare workers and emergency first responders, that they feel surrounded by encouragement and gratitude in the face of exhaustion and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For chaplains and caregivers, that their presence bring peace to the suffering and that they have strength for these days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the grocery workers, pharmacists, and delivery drivers, that they be strong and resilient, and we treat them with gratitude and appreciation. Lord, in our mercy, hear our prayers. For people who live by themselves to know that they are never, ever alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who cross our streets, rest in our parks, sit on roadside benches, ask us for spare change, who have no home with four walls and a door, May they find a place of belonging. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the parents with kids at home, may they give themselves grace and rest amidst the chaos. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For kids who miss their friends, that they know will all be together again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For teachers and educators who are seeking all means to strengthen these days while apart with creative instruction and care, Lord have mercy, hear our prayer. For high school seniors and others navigating unexpected loss of an ending, that they find peace in life-giving ways to mark the transitions ahead, Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those whose jobs have been lost, reduced, or furloughed, that they feel the generosity and sustenance of the community that surround them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For older adults whose visits from friends and family have been restricted, that they know our love is not restricted to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, you do hear the prayers of these your people. We give them to you, we lift them to you, trusting that you hear them, that you know them, that you see us, and that you love us. We know that you love us because of your son Jesus, who came that we may have life and have it to the full, who lived and died and rose again for our sake, our sake and who taught us these words, that we might pray together through all time and space. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Last week, I found myself doing something I've never done before, which is weeping in the checkout line at Trader Joe's. Yes, I had found all the things I was looking for. And I, as I stood in the checkout line, waiting to buy all the groceries I needed for the week, amidst all the fear and all the masks and all the distance and whatnot, I looked at the woman in front of me and saw in her cart, nestled between the bags of frozen chicken and the the loaves of bread, I saw an Easter lily. An Easter lily nestled right there in her bag, basket. And all I could think about was all that that Easter lily represented, all the ways that it felt like a mockery of this Easter where we are having to observe this holy day in the midst of the pandemic. Who would see it? Who would she share it with? What would it mean when Easter is at home? Over these weeks of imagining Easter in the time of quarantine, I confess that I have found myself mourning a little bit, mourning what we have lost. Things like a sanctuary full of Easter lilies, the flower cross, the handbells, and the hallelujah song that seems to lift and hang 
in our holy dome overhead. And yes, I've even found myself mourning the inevitable wrestling and bribing my children into their new Easter outfits. That's the Easter I hunger for. The 11 a.m. Easter, the sun blazing unequivocally across the sky Easter, the lilies burst wide open, the trumpet sounding, the organ swelling, the moments that leave you without a question in your mind, that love will win, that death won't be the end, that life in all its fullness is here, is everywhere and cannot be missed. That's the Easter that I hunger for. But that's not the Easter that we have. Pandemic notwithstanding, that's not the Easter many of us have in our everyday life, right? For too many of us live in the gardens of Thursday begging God to take this cup from us, the cup of anger or fear or addiction, of never feeling like we are enough. Too many of us live like Judas in the shadows in between, guiltily selling our soul to the highest bidder, earthly treasures in exchange for our loyalty. Too many of us live on the horizons of history, littered with Friday's crosses of suffering, suffering from the violent hands of another, suffering without basic means to survive. Too many of us live in the heavy waiting of Saturday, sick with grief and stuck because there is no bright hope for tomorrow. Too many of us live in the darkness, a far cry from those times that leave you without a question in your mind that love will win, that death won't be the final answer, that life is bursting forth everywhere you turn in all its fullness. Writer Debbie Thomas's words this week about this particularly anxious Easter and what is it what it is revealing to all of us struck a particular chord with me and lodged itself right into my spirit. For she too names the dissonance of celebrating resurrection while death and suffering rage all around us. What feels possible now, she says, is to stay very close to the story to stay very close to the story, not to everything pretty we've added to it over the millennia, but to the messy, chaotic, barely comprehensible Easter story itself. The story of scattered grave cloths, of confused running, of timid peaks beneath empty tombs, of tears and more tears, of hope and uncertainty intertwined, of faith waiting in the shadows, for understanding. And so as we find ourselves this year in an unusual Easter, we find ourselves getting very close to that story today. And we can feel its darkness, can't we? For after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Matthew tells us, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. But as we know, the dawn is not the day. The dawn is not the day. Last at the cross and first at the tomb, it was darkness that surrounded Mary and Mary on their journey to the tomb. Faithfully attending to the task of visiting the tombs of their beloved, these women's job was like so many others who visit tombs. It was to confirm death. But instead, the grounds shook, the plates shifted, an earthquake surrounded them, an angel descended like lightning, and soldiers were so afraid they were like dead men, Matthew tells us. A new world seemed to break the ground beneath their feet and pierce through the darkness that had traveled with them from that hill far away. For Mary and Mary found themselves swept up in an indelible invitation to announce life. Do not be afraid, the angel said. I know that you've been looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here for he has been raised. Last at the cross and first at the tomb, Mary and Mary were sent with fear and great joy. The first witnesses of the resurrection the first given good news to go 
and proclaim. The dawn is not the day, a beginning, not the end, the first, not the final. For these bold women run from the tomb, but they go with great joy and with fear. And so we who remain close to, the, to this first story, we wonder about our own stories like they do. We wonder when will the day come? When will the light break through? When will the fear give way? When will the suffering end? When will the sadness lift? When will we return to what we once knew? This week, our Common Table Bible Study read a quote from Dallas Willard and found it especially helpful as we mark a most unusual Holy Week. He said this, We don't believe something by merely saying we believe it, or even when we believe that we believe it. We believe something when we act as if it were true. We believe something when we act as if it were true. We believe resurrection, the radical good news found in an empty tomb in the dark darkness when we act as if it were true. That feels awfully difficult this year and you might find yourself wondering, how are we going to act as if that were true? How, how will the darkness break through? How will the light break through the darkness? How will the dawn give way today? Well, by getting close to the story, by attending to the movement of God in the world, by showing up for each other, by bringing groceries and sending notes and giving thanks, by planting a garden and baking bread and planning for the future, by resting and listening and bearing witness to what we've seen and heard, by looking away from the news so that we can look toward one another. Act as if it's true. Act like you believe, Rachel Held Evans once said, and maybe at long last you will. Move your feet and your heart will catch up. Friends, I find myself, even this week, even when it feels hard to believe, I find myself acting as if it were true because I see you acting as it is true. You're doing that for each other, even if you don't realize it. It's like our kids whose attentive eyes are noticing birds' eggs about to hatch and butterflies aloft in the breeze, worms deep in the dirt, and God's glorious creation bursting with life abundant. It's like the dozen of faithful friends who gather each night for evening prayer, committing their presence to one another, even through a screen to hold each other's griefs and fears and anxieties so that rest can come. It's like our deacons, who with help from Nikki and the missions committee, bought meals at four different local restaurants to feed all the night shift emergency room employees at Novant Forsyth Hospital. On Friday night, as we remembered the one who faced suffering square in the face so that the world might live. It's like Gary, who will ascend our steeple tower yet again, but not for construction this time, but rather to manually ring our church bell at noon on Easter, because not even a global virus or a dormant bell motor from months of rest can hold back his alleluias. Friends, the dawn is not the day, but the sun will rise. The light will pierce through the darkness. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. It won't be a return to normal, no. For the Lord is risen. God is set loose in the world. Love has won and we will be changed. May it be so for you today on Easter. May it be so for you in these days and weeks to come. For the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. 
Let's join together in singing Christ is Risen. of the resurrection for the joy of this day let's offer to God our thanks and praise So now as we end this form of worship, to begin again the worship that is our very lives, may Christ go before you to prepare a way of service. May Christ go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for his glory. May Christ go beside you as leader and guide. Christ go within you as comfort and stay. Christ go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ go above you to reign as Lord Supreme. Go in peace and sing hallelujah. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.